new edition of the History Podcast. Today we have a power player in the industry, Kathy Hardinen, Vice President of Research and Development for Applied Process with a PhD on ADI. How's it going, Kathy? It's going well. How are you doing, Carlos? I'm doing fantastic. Looking forward to our conversation. The topic of today is just fascinating. Hatred is not dead. Kathy actually uh, just uh, did a paper on this subject. And I believe I do actually presented on the last Hitrit show in the, uh, San Luis, Missouri, right? And when, is, is that correct? That is correct. It was one of the keynote addresses at the, the Hitrit Society show. It was, uh, it was a keynote. I got uh, very good comments and reviews about it. And uh, I, I thought to myself, you know, we should really have Kathy on the podcast talking about what, why Hitrit is very alive and, and it's, it's, it's not that at all. So I don't know if you want to start a little bit uh, just in, uh, with an introduction of who you are. You know, uh, I saw your CV and it has a bunch of, of, uh, of heat treat. Uh, you know, uh, we, we got a Foundry Educational Foundation. You know, uh, you're uh, in applied process, Duke Lyons uh, Society. Uh, you know, ASTM International. So just, just, just give us a little bit of, of background of, 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 the, of uh, who Kathy uh, is, the, the PhD of ADI, and just, just for the audience to know the quality of, of the guests that we have today. So Carlos, I like to describe myself as, um, I'm almost like a, what we call a one trick pony. I've spent, um, pretty much my entire career working with OS tempering. I got introduced to um, OS tempering as part of my senior design project as an undergraduate at Michigan Tech. And I kind of went from there and I had worked summers in um, cast iron founders and um, got involved with um, a, a professor by the name of Carl Runman, who at that time was one of the world experts on ADI research. And so I had an opportunity to work for him get a master's degree and a, and a PhD. And then I did some postdoc work with him. And along the way, I, I met um, Chip Keogh. Right. And um, how Chip and I met was um, as a requirement for the funding for my master's degree, I had to speak at the national convention for the American Founders Society. And the first time I gave a talk, um, you can imagine the first time you're giving a talk, you're a student, you're at a the room was packed. People had shown up because they thought my advisor was going to be speaking, not expecting it was going to be me. And there was Chip sitting in the front row. And after I finished my talk, he came up to me and handed me his business card and said, you know, when you finally finish school, I should be the first person you talk to about a job. And that's how I met him. And I ended up, it wasn't a direct, I finished school. and I went to work for Chip, but I eventually ended up working for Chip. And we spent, you know, better part of 20 years together further exploring um, heat treatment. And so I've kind of been connected to the foundry industry and the heat treat industry through all of these activities. And it's right. been a, a great career path. It, it is, and I believe uh, you meeting Chip uh, was destiny if you were doing all your work on ADI because uh, Chip was like the number one promoted on the world of ADI. I, I think he still is. We actually have a podcast with him. And, uh, you know, uh, making that team and actually uh using your knowledge and and your uh your skills on the real application on like uh, it's done on on the applied process you know what a job to have right if, if you like uh research and development basically is what you do right it, it was the perfect place for me to land to be to be creative you know over the years i got a chance to work on commercializing a lot of different versions of the OS tempering process, you know, working on carbo OS tempering, working on um, carbidic um, OS temper ductile iron, just, you know, variations and, and learning how to use heat treatment to develop customized microstructures that then deliver properties that customers are looking for. And that's kind of what I've been doing through my career path. And just, just wanted to just go a little bit more into uh your presentation on the topic of today and, and why uh, you chose this topic you know because it's it's very strong right mm -hmm. uh, actually the, the the complete topic of, of, of your of your conference is ferrous metallurgy and heat treatment are not dead right but why, why such a hard statement 
So, so, so when I got asked to do a keynote, I, I thought about technical topics because I, and I thought, well, the obvious thing would have been for me to talk about something dealing with os tempering. And I thought, well, I don't just want to be, you know, ordinary and be that predictable. And I started thinking about my career path in, in the um, metal casting and heat treating world. And I realized that I have spent a career not listening to advice that I've been given. So, so for instance, when I was an undergraduate, I was told, um, don't go into ferrous metallurgy because big steel is dead. And then when I was in, in working on my um, advanced degrees, I was told, oh, cast iron is a low tech material. Don't, don't work with that. And then when I came into my professional career, I was told salt bath heat treating. Well, who does that anyway? And then I even had somebody who says something I, I still find offensive. Um, I was at a technical meeting and somebody said to me, applied process, you have a PhD? Aren't you bored or were you just desperate for a job? I was like, really? Really? So yeah, so when you, when you hear all that kind of stuff, it, I, I realized that as a, I'm, I'm kind of one of those stubborn people that doesn't like to be told no. And so I pushed it um, because that's where my interests were, even though I was told don't do it. But real, realistically for the next generation, um, do they have that fortitude to keep pushing? When somebody says something, oh, don't do that, are they likely to just walk away? And are we losing a lot of talent because somebody has told someone, don't do that, when in fact there is a lot of potential there for, for a really great career path? And now, when, when they told you that big steel, or maybe in, in cast iron, um, an ADI was low tech, and you know, uh, there was no future for it. And I saw uh, the data that you put on your presentation. Uh, there's a bunch of uh, steel usage still nowadays and growing. And I see that uh, we, you even separate the amount of growth that there's been in the States and in China and the numbers, they just keep up. What's your opinion on that? So, you know, so I started, I started digging into, to try and figure out, you know, why was I told that? And, and some of the things that, the first thing that I learned was that in the time when I was an undergraduate, there was um, a national initiative going on in the US that involved a, a lot of um, materials and metallurgy people. And the conclusion of the, of, the, of the initiative and the committee discussions was that the recommendations were to go to a more broader based materials type education away from specializing in metallurgy. So I was on that cusp of where you could get a metallurgy degree, but now it's, it's much more rare to find that opportunity. And so I, I think where the message got kind of mixed up was that when there was this initiative to, to get a more of a broader based materials education, that automatically that had to mean that metallurgy had to be dead. And so I think there, there's a miscommunication there because of the changes, the tracking and some of this attitude changes um, with the tracking of how department changes went. So when I, when I was an undergrad, you got a degree in uh, metallurgical engineering, but then all of a sudden it went to metallurgical and materials engineering, and then it became material science and engineering and metallurgy goes away from the title. Well, when metallurgy goes away from the title, there's this simultaneous opinion that starts to develop that, okay, you don't need that degree. So I think that plays into part of it. The other thing that was going on in, you know, in the 1980s when I was an undergraduate was in the decade before that, you know, steel, raw steel production in the, in the U.S. was somewhere around, um, I think it's something like 111,000 um, tons. But a decade later, it's down to something like in the low 70,000 tons. So there's this big drop all of a sudden in a decade. So certainly that was the message that was received was this is the death of the industry. So, so now as we move forward to, you know, you know, modern day steel world, the, the advances, especially in the, um, the advanced high strength steels are just amazing. I mean, we're talking about going down to, to much thinner gauge sections. So if you're basing your metrics totally on weight production and you're now using thinner gauge material, you're not gonna see a reflection in an increase, big increases in tonnage because you're using less of the material because you're using these advanced high strength steels. And, and that's, that's the miscommunication that's happening. Again, you have to have the narrative that explains it. 
Now, of all of the, the different sectors that I investigated, certainly I think the steel folks are getting the message out better than other folks are. And they're making a bunch of money right now with the steel prices going up, right? So I don't uh, think they're dying or they're having a bad time, right? No, steel, no, they're, steel... they're, they're, doing a really, they're doing a really good job. There, there's, there's actually, um, they have some really great websites. Um, the World Steel websites are great, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. where, where they're very good about communicating that message. And they're, they're, the other thing that they're getting really good at is learning how to communicate the sustainability message. Because I think really, if we're going to appeal to the next generation, sustainability is really something the next generation takes to heart. And, and I believe you've made a great point about how technology has uh, become a factor for less steel usage or better say optimization of steel, right? Uh -huh. uh, and of course, there's other, other uh, elements or, or ways to uh, use, uh, apply to these like cast iron, aluminum, you mentioned titanium as well, uh, that uh, are for different applications. Like everybody's talking about aluminum right now because they want to make their parts lighter, right? It's, it's like what, what everyone wants. But there's also uh, right now with uh, space exploration that everybody's talking about titanium right now. But uh, just for, because you have this metallurgical background uh, and I know you're an, an ADI guy, a cast iron, a cast iron person. But can you just briefly explain the difference between cast iron, steel, aluminum, and titanium for the application itself? Why, what are the pros and cons of each? So, so in, in terms of, you know, the, the general relationships, um, so, so cast iron actually is much more versatile. It's not just for skillets only, as I like to tell folks. Um, you, you'll see a cast iron used in, um, components on an automobile, on, on heavy trucks. You'll see it used as, as uh, wear components um, in the agricultural world, um, even, even parts on rail systems. So it's a, it's a pretty versatile material. In, and what you, can, what you can do with it is dependent upon whether you're using an ASCAS structure or whether you're using heat treatment to enhance properties. Um, steel has an advantage over cast iron in that it, it's a stiffer material. Um, you can get some some nice high strengths with steel. The, the penalties that, that most people try to point out with, with cast iron and steel usage is that it's the weight thing. It's the density paradigm. Mm -hmm. Well, cast iron has a density that's roughly 10% less than you'll get from steel. So, you know, steel, a lot of, a lot of it's used in infrastructure. Um, the advanced high strength steels have made great, great um, improvements for the automotive industry. You know, you'll, you'll see a lot of steel used in appliances. There's, there's other heavy equipment that uses a lot of steel. Um, aluminum, you know, the, the thing you always hear about aluminum is the, the density advantage. Density the, the advantage, lightweight, you know, pretty you know, much. And, and you can't fight, you know, when somebody want, pulls out the density card and you've got an iron-based material and an aluminum, well, you're not gonna win the argument. You're right? done. You're yeah, done. you're done. Yeah, 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 case closed, all right? So, so with, so with um, titanium in comparison to, you know, and, and aluminum competes with, um, with a lot of components on an automotive body. Um, there, there are, um, for instance, Ford had the all aluminum F-150 pickup truck that launched several years ago. So there are, there's a competitive thing going on all the time with the trade-offs with iron-based materials and aluminum in the automotive world. And I based out of the Detroit area, so I hear that, that part of the discussion all the time. Titanium gives you, has a high strength to weight ratio, usually strengths that are comparable to um, steel, but it has a density that's about, I think, believe what's something like about 40% less than steel. So um, where titanium is most commonly recognized is it has a really good biocompatibility. So it's used for a lot of medical implants. In fact, I have a partial titanium femur on my, on my left leg. That's another apl application, right? Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. So when when just hearing this, I mean, there's a bunch of applications still for uh, this type of uh, heat treatment or ferrous metallurgical, as you said, right? And some of the the on the way your expertise is right now, it's on salt quenching. Uh, uh, you you talk also in your presentation about molten salts and then the evolutions to uh, 
IQ furnaces or UBQAs as uh -huh. uh, I, I've been in a couple of uh, applied process plants. So what, what do you think uh, this is going to continue to evolve, right? I mean, uh, the, the market, the trends that they're seeing, it, and especially in automotive, they want to produce high volume, uh -huh. but, you know, reducing the cost, you know, punishing a lot the, the pricing of the stock, uh, being more productive, less, less scrap, and, and very, very, very few tolerances, right? And uh -huh. now with the electric vehicle coming up with, uh, you know, uh, advanced manufacturing, right? Uh, everybody is kind of, uh, I, I wouldn't say scared, but they're just waiting for that inflection point to the, the you know, the change to happen, right? Uh -huh. Everything to settle and see we, where they land, right? So I, I know on, on, on the ostempering process, when, when we're doing cell quenching, we, uh, you do a lot of heavy stuff, right? For, uh, you know, trucking, but, uh, you know, tractors, truckings, but where do you think everything's going to land when the, B, the EV goes uh, to market? We got a bunch of uh, advanced manufacturing. Do you think heat treat is going to uh, decrease its capacity? And I'm not just saying uh, on, on, on salt quench, but you know, on uh, LPC, uh, oil quench, um, the, the aluminum treatment, heat treatment, is it going to stay? or it, it might grow? Well, I think it has the capability to go either way, depending upon what our, what our approach is going to be. So I think if we take the, the traditional approach and that is to sit back and wait, then we might see the contraction. I think what's important is, to, is you gotta be proactive and get in on the front end. Especially, especially auto, automotive cycles um, in dealing with them. If you're not in on the front end on the cycle and you miss the cycle for the decision making, then you're left out in the cold waiting for the next opportunity for when you can, when that decision is going to be made on the material. So, so what I think we have to do as an industry is is find a way to get ourselves at that table, looking at you know what are the applications. And what material solutions, value add packages with heat treatment can we add that are cost effective? And if we don't do that up front, then we're going to we're going to miss the opportunity. Who, who, which uh, trends or which which materials do you think there's there's uh, they're the biggest biggest threat to our industry? Uh, we we talked about plastics. Now we're talking about uh, advanced manufacturing. Um, now there's uh, the everybody's uh, talking about uh, hot hot isostatic press in the hip, right? Mm -hmm. But um, what, who do you think will be the materials that can compete with what we do and actually get uh, the 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 properties that we need? It's it's resistance, it's, it's hardening, it's it's it's, it's uh, uh, some it's, it's sometimes a case depth. Uh, what do you think uh, will be your biggest threat? if we just sit back and relax? I, I think that what we have to do is we have to, there's a, there's a paradigm shift in terms of learning how to design with our capabilities that we have in terms of materials and heat treat combinations. I think some of the biggest mistakes that we do is that we, instead of starting with a blank sheet and thinking about, okay, we need this part and it needs to function this way, and here's where we need to put material, and this is what we can do to lower the weight. Um, we don't we don't think along that. So we have there are other paradigm shifts that we have to think about first before we start tackling some of these big some of these big questions. And I think we get sidetracked um, with the worrying about the end game without realizing what steps do we need to take to get to the end game. I don't know if I'm making sense here, but, but I, I really, really think that there's, there are capabilities in, for instance, in steel um, to be on the, on the EVs that, that we need to think about in terms of how you can lightweight steel, because that's the real big concern as everybody's talking about, we're gonna to have to go to lightweight materials on the EVs because of the requirements for the batteries or, 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 or other components that are gonna be really heavy. Mm -hmm. Well, again, this means we have to take a look at what materials we have, how can we design and use them effectively? 
because you know one of the things that I that I've learned in in my career, career path, and I have a, a real smart engineer who works for me who who does this all the time, is he he looks at a situation and says, okay, like let's suppose I have a weldment here and I want to replace this with a casting, which is going to be lighter weight. Why well, don't just have to reproduce the weldment? I can produce any kind of design as long as that design suits the function. I think that's what we have to start doing. And that's where we employ the next generation of the really smart folks who know how to model and can picture these different outcomes. We have to, we have to get away from just doing the same old thing. And, and that's, what's going to, that's what's going to keep heat treatment alive and vibrant is learning how to keep, just keep pushing forward with the new ideas and employing them. And here's a challenge that I, I believe uh, we see mutually, and I know that you work uh, very close to the designers of the material on, on the, the, the customers. But sometimes we're just, as a, as a heat reader, right? We're just giving a spec, right? And uh -huh. say, I, this is the part, this is the material, and this is the results I want. And this, uh -huh. is the rest, the, this is the recipe. And the guys that have the experience, the theory, the preparation, they look at it and say, hey, we can make this better. We can make this easier. We can save money. We can be more productive. And you go back to the customer and they go like, no, this is the way we specify it. We don't want to know anything about a deviation. There yeah. are very seldom customers that, uh, that approve to a, devi a, a deviation. And if so, they want to claim like a productivity cost. Uh, otherwise, they won't listen to you unless they're saving money. But there's mm -hmm. ways to be more productive, have less distortion, uh, you know, run parts more effectively. What's your, what's your experience when, when trying to push back, uh, when you know you have a, 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 a faster way, a better way, uh, a cheaper way to get the results customer wants, uh, you know, that goes against their, not, not against, but, you know, the, improving their spec. I, you know, I, I understand what you're saying because um, I, always, I always use the statement that design engineers by nature are some of the most conservative creatures out there in the world. Um, they, they, they're resistant to change. I, I have learned that you have to be able to have an example that shows demonstrated success. And you really have to work hard on the education front. I mean, that, that's where, where um, the heat treat world is really lacking is because in, you know, when, as we're training the next generation of design engineers, our message is often absent from that training. And so when you have an engineer who enters into their professional career, if they've never been introduced to a topic, they can't very well consider that topic in the design. So one of the things that you have to do is if you're going to do that, you have to be very persistent and have a really good educational value package with concrete examples. Because if you just go in there and make a recommendation, somebody's got to take it on faith that you know what you're doing. And it's really hard for them to make that leap of faith. But if you have those really detailed case studies that you can show them and demonstrate, you'll find that, that um, maybe you're not always successful at generating change, but you're more successful with that kind of a value package than you are with just going in and saying, hey, we should try and do this. And I believe that's a great observation. It comes all to the scientific method, right? If you tell uh -huh. a guy, you know, I know how I can do, I can do this, uh, let's say, more productive, right? Uh -huh. uh, I know how to, right? But if you tell the guy, I have proven papers uh -huh. that can actually uh, prove scientifically that this is uh, a better way to do it, right? Not just my opinion, right? So that's uh, correct. He, he, I think that's a you know I, I think it's a great advice. I'm I'm taking it right now because uh, sometimes you just have a call or you just meet with a purchasing guy and say hey or I don't know and you just go like hey I I want to have a deviation of the process to be more productive, but you're not building a case. You're 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 just like. Uh, chatting right so uh -huh. I, I i believe if you back up on scientific data and i don't know with a part or with with a paper will give more uh, the, the case will build uh, a more uh, robust uh, uh solid case for for success right so That's yeah correct yeah great great advice thank you coming from a phd of course 
<laughs> right? Yeah, well, I'm a data collector by nature, Carlos. Yeah, data, well, it's it's all about data, right? And uh -huh. and right now that data it's it's becoming like the trend thing. Everybody's talking about data, and now Facebook coming with Meta and things like that. Uh, we do have a bunch of data on heat treat that we need to process. And mm -hmm. we actually can conclude on something, right? Because we do things all over and over, over, over and over again, and we can come to a conclusion. But you have to analyze data. And I, I just want to move a little bit uh, on, on the subject we were supposed to talk about. Now that you're okay. telling me that you're a data collector, what can you tell the people that are hearing about data? How they should be seeing them? I mean, they're, uh, you know, a heat trading stuff all over and not over and over again, but they're looking specifically at that batch that goes into uh, into the, sp the specification, right? But I believe there's very seldom people who looks at all the data points and actually analyze a macro trend. Do you do you have a experience on that? So so yes and yes and no. I I think that we probably don't do it. Um, enough in, in, in terms of um, our process. But um, there's always an, an, an opportunity to take a look at, um, I, look, I like to look at, especially when you look at um, a long running part, I like to look at trends to see shifts where sometimes you, I, I, always, I always use this example with our folks on the rare occasion when we have a, a quality issue. Because by human human nature is to to what make something in our minds more efficient to short you know you look at a process and you say well why am I spending all that time doing it when I could do this and I could be more efficient well the the, the problem is sometimes when you when you have this intention of improving efficiency what you're doing is you're shortcutting a process but so maybe if you move something just a little bit it doesn't have a big effect on product quality. But as you start to slowly adapt it and move it over time, then all of a sudden you get closer and closer to the cliff and you fall off the quality cliff. And then you go and you have a conversation and you say, well, what changed? Well, nothing changed. I've been doing this all the time. Well, no, actually something did change, but you changed it so slowly over time that you had no idea that you were getting close to the drop off. And, and so I like to, I, I'm always fascinated by those types of, of retrospective looking at data or looking at trends, because we all say we do things the same way time after time after time, when in fact, you may not really be doing things the same way time after time after time. So I think by, as, as you, if you take the, the opportunity to look at like say your five largest, longest running parts, in your system and do that kind of analysis and say, okay, you know, where did I start off with ranges in, in certification for hardness, you know, five years ago and where am I at today? And then try to figure out if you, if you see, some, see some shifts because usually you can go back and look at some, something that changed subtle in your processing and you can make an assessment as to whether or not that was a value added change or whether that's not a value added change. So yeah, I, I am, I am a, um, a proponent of doing that. However, having the opportunity to do it often doesn't happen when you're just in the throes of, of trying to get your production out the door. Right. That's the unfortunate Pro thing. Production you know? always kills uh, oh, yeah. all, all, in, all innovation, right? Hey, we, yeah. we have to try this out. Like there's no way to innovate. We just have to get things uh, out of the garage. We have to get parts running. I, I mean, but... Uh, it is what it is, right? But uh -huh. I believe that's a big challenge. Uh, there are very, there are very few R and D's uh, center for heat treatment on, 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 in the world, which I believe you have one, right? Yeah, I, I have a, I have a, I have a, a group. Um, I have a, I have a PhD, and then I have two master's degree um, folks. One has a master's degree in um, mechanical engineering and a bachelor's degree in material science and engineering, and the other has both a um, bachelor's and a master's in metallurgical engineering. So, so we're kind of the, the nerds of heat treatment. The nerds, well, I would say the, the, the innovators, as I would like to call it. Uh, but you know, uh, you, you wrote a, a, a very interesting subject, you know, because you have this such great team with a lot of knowledge, but as well, uh, it, it's, it's widely known that in the future, one of the jobs with, with uh, more demand will be 
uh, uh, data analysts, right? Uh, the guys that know how to uh, analyze data and read trends. So uh -huh. I, I will very humbly suggest uh, that you, you get one of those guys in your team. Because it's it's on the wish list. Um, okay. Right right now, I'm I'm working on building um, modeling capabilities. Right, right. You know, being able to to um, to model what's going on more accurately in a in a salt bath quench. Learning how to understand more accurately how each part cools in the heat treat basket and what information does that does that tell me and how does that help me to to be more efficient in uh, material selection or heat treatment things like that yeah. right if, if on on modeling and simulation uh you know i i believe we still have a, a long way to go uh against uh other fields like aerodynamics and stuff but uh i've seen a couple of softwares that uh, can simulate fluid dynamics, heat transfers, but it's, it's very uh, time consuming because you have to model the load and uh, the parts, the densities. There's a bunch of variables that goes on every, or on every piece. And if, if you're uh, playing with agitation, the, the program can take days and days to load and give you a, a conclusion or a solution. You know, it takes a special type of person who who can do that modeling type of work. I, you know, my my staff likes to tease me because when I did my required computer programming class, um, I was one of the last classes that used punched cards. So, you know, my technical capabilities <laughs> that front are to be the the visionary and and see the concept, not to actually do it. Mm -hmm. well, well, you have the vision, right? Uh -huh. well, and, and speaking of which, uh, some things I, I do believe we, we as an industry are not doing really well. And actually, I believe uh, on this, we are actually dying. And I believe it's the lack of talent the industry has right now, uh, because uh, from uh, talking to everybody, and I don't know that this is a real fact or not, but people which have been in the industry for 50 years, 40 years, right? They're starting to retire, right? And uh -huh. those were the guys that uh, heat treated stuff uh, all, all their lives, you know, uh, looked at the part, knew how furnaces work, knew how materials behave if something went wrong, you know, what happens if we quench fast, if we quench slow, if we add more temperature, if we are more carbon to a specific type of steel. But these guys, you know, are retiring and I don't believe the industry is filling the gap of that knowledge that is retiring with, with, with newer guys. And, and it's, it's a big gap and the industry is starting to fill it, right? And that's a good, that's a good uh, those are good news for commercial key traders, right? Because they're experts on the subject and captains are a little more generalist. But uh, what, what's your opinion on that? How, what are we not doing right as an industry to fill that gap to, to be an industry that uh, is as sexy or, or interesting as all the, the high tech or the fintech industry that all the, all the younger guys they want to work in uh, because this is a very passionate industry but you just have to give it a try and after you give it a try you're here for life right okay so so you said the 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 operative phrase you have to give it a try you know the the millennials uh, and, the, and the folks who are coming behind them in, in, in the uh, pipeline for, for future um, employees, we have to start with offering internships when they're in college. Okay. Because, you know, some of the best advice I got as an undergraduate was you need to do your due diligence and learn about the career path you've chosen. So we need to offer, and, and when you offer an internship, here's the other thing that you have to do. You have to have a meaningful program or project for the student to work on. Because you can't just hire them to substitute for some guy who's gonna be on vacation on second shift or be sweeping the floor. You need to give them something that challenges them and is a meaningful project. And when you, when you do that, that's when you're the most successful. And, and this is an opportunity for you to, to form a relationship with some talent who you could possibly bring on as a new hire when they graduate. But I tell everybody, internships are the, are the way to do it because this, the next generations are very experiential by nature. 
So they need, they like to experience things. So let them experience what our industry is and, and, and show them, demonstrate to them what a great career path and opportunity they have if they join our industry. So, so, and just help me out here. I, I believe that's a great uh, way to get people into the industry. Uh, as I say, give it a try, and, but you don't have something meaningful uh, because there's the common belief that when you have an intern, uh, just the guys are just gonna, you know, warm the seat, right? And they will learn by watching, which is the case sometimes. But if you give uh -huh. them a purpose, a challenge, uh -huh. a problem to solve and you have somebody or yourself if, if you're like the manager or the owner or the president of the company to kind of follow up with them you will get them hooked but i believe the mistake is just saying okay just go and watch out uh, uh for anything to happen right i, I don't know how how uh, internships are will, so will be the right way to do it because i i, I think people that hated their internship that they had to do it because they're just warming the seat and people that just got cooked like, like yourself, right, on the job uh -huh. because they, they, they find something meaningful to do. I, I think that when you're, you're most successful, and, and as I look back at the internships that I had, you know, I had some where the assignments were not so great, but I had some that were just absolutely wonderful. And, the, and, and where it was a great experience was when I had that meaningful project and I had a mentor who was on site, somebody who checked in with me, somebody who talked to me, somebody who was there for questions, somebody who took an interest in what I was doing. That's what we have to do is it's, it's, a, it's a providing opportunities and you also have to mentor. You know, if you look at the studies, most people quit jobs and move on, not because they're dissatisfied with pay, it's because they're dissatisfied with their boss and their supervision. So you need to make sure that you provide that opportunity. Another thing that our industry could do a better job of of is providing projects for senior design groups at universities. Um, giving a research project to a university where a, a team of young engineers, future engineers works on that and mentoring those folks. And it's a twofer because not only are you getting a, a trained workforce opportunity, but you're also getting a question answered or a problem solved for you. Um, when you look at the access that, you know, a group of um, juniors or seniors in college have to advanced equipment in a, in a university setting and the technologies and, and the things that they can do. And if you give them a little bit of freedom to, to approach your problem from a different viewpoint, it's not locked into something that you're thinking it has to be solved this way. You can get a very creative solution. It's amazing what they can do. I mean, I, I sit as a member of the, um, the advisory board for the, the, the MSC department at Michigan Tech where I went to school. And part of our annual meeting every year is we, we evaluate and judge the design projects. And I am amazed at what the students do in some of these projects. You know, I, there's an opportunity for our, the heat treat industry to, to come up with projects and engage students that way as well. Um, Kathy, it's it's been great talking uh, to you about uh, the trends. Why heat is not dead, and why do we what do we need to do as an industry just to fill up the talent? And I do believe you 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 fight with this every day. Uh, you know, uh, doing research and development, getting uh, you know working with universities, uh, getting uh, you know uh, mentoring uh, interns. Right, you have a team. Right, so I wish there were more. Uh, PhDs like you that saw the the world like this because uh, sometimes the, the the trend is to believe that the PhD guy is just doing research and his own thing, but it's all about teamwork and inviting the guys to see, hey, this is what we do, this is how we can innovate, and we're not just a, a, another sloppy industry uh, like you said, low 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 tech, right? There's a bunch of technology in what we do. We just need to show it and keep doing R and D. Right. Mm -hmm. but, Absolutely. Uh, and, and this can become a, a very, very uh, innovative industry. Like you say, if we take the time, have an early department and we do not let production, uh, you know, uh, stop or stop or uh, uh, research and development. Now, one last question to finish the podcast. Um, 
you, you've been, um, all your professional career working on heat treatment, research and development, I'm pretty sure you have seen a bunch of uh, parts heat treater, different applications, different customers, different heat treat shops. Uh, I believe once you and I met in uh, Germany, you've been into a bunch of uh, heat treat shows, fairs, events, conferences, uh, and, and, then, and you have learned a bunch of stuff uh, you know, uh, by talking to people, by doing things yourself, by, by uh, researching it. And you were taught many things by your mentors. I'm talking about Chip, right? On, 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 the, on the business side, because Chip was a great CEO and a great mentalist, still is. Mm -hmm. And uh, but if, if you could give an advice to these new guys that are choosing, a, a, you know, an industry to go, should I go to, you know, uh, heat treat or should I go to, should I be a lawyer or should I go and uh, be in logistics, right? Uh, to the guy that chooses heat treat, right? And says, okay, I'm gonna give it a try. Like what, what we wanna do, right? What will be something that you would like to share with this guy? I, I think the, the one thing, my, the one um, regret that I have about when I was looking at, you know, career paths is that I, I didn't probe. There are some really great networks that you can, you can take advantage of at local technical meet, meetings for societies that are tailored to your industry, or, or perhaps try to, to find inroads into those connections. And I really value my network, my professional network. And I think I have a really great professional network, but I think I was a little late at coming to the game for some of that. And, and, and I, would, I would encourage people, you gotta learn how to put yourself out there. I mean, people look at me now and they see a, a project in the making for several decades, but I wasn't always so um, um, outgoing when I was a student. And you have to really learn how to become outgoing and go looking for information that's not Google because you can't Google someone's brain, the contents of their brain. And, and I think that that was the one mistake that I made is that I didn't work on that personal face-to-face -face network early enough in my career. And I, I would encourage you have, to, you have to do that. You have to close the laptop, turn off the cell phone, Yes, they are important tools, but there's so much more that you learn from a face-to-face -face conversation with somebody than you can ever learn from, you know, Wikipedia. And you just nailed what I'm doing in here. That's why I started the podcast. Uh, exactly what, what you're saying, you know, because there's a bunch of, 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 uh, of people very interesting, uh, with very interesting topics, very, very, uh, very eager to talk about our industry, about the, or, or share passion, uh, ways to do things. Uh, in your cases, uh, ADI or stempering. But there's guys that they just like to talk about alloy or you know atmospheres, brick, uh, you know uh, induction. And the more you talk to, the more you learn because every brain is a universe, right? Mm -hmm. And, Absolutely. And, and, and people, and, and I get what you're saying, you know, people is shy uh, because, uh, well, just look at yourself, you know, uh, I, I was actually, uh, you know, uh, a little scared about having a podcast and interviewing a PhD on metallurgy. I have to be very careful of, of my questions, right? So, you, you know, just just go for it. There's no don't care question, you know, and, and what, I, what I can find out is that people are very, always very happy to 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 talk about uh, you know a subject to talk to you to answer questions and uh, you know I I do believe it's a great advice you know the the more you build your network you make you know you make good colleagues you make good uh, you you made a great network but you also make a bunch of great friends uh -huh. uh, by by that share the same passion but you have to be outgoing you don't have to be afraid to ask but I can lie to you. You know, sometimes you feel, uh, you know, afraid or or a little fearful when when you're talking to such, uh, you know, industry figures like yourself, right? So <laughs> that, that'll be my counter advice to you. You know, uh, be, be, because 
you know, uh, when you talk to a PhD about mental you say, you know, you know, you have to be very careful what you say and what you ask because it's well, a very you know, Carlos, uh, we're real people too. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yes, I understand. Just, just give you know, my, 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 my feedback, but you know, uh, thank you so much for doing this. And I believe uh, what you do actually makes a difference in the world by, you know, mentoring guys, doing research and development or industry and, and having that approach. Uh, you know, thank you so much, Kathy. Really enjoyed this conversation. And uh, I hope this is not the last time we talk and hopefully we can see ourselves in person in a show or in a, or in an expo. That would be fantastic. All right. Well, thank you, Carlos. I, I really enjoyed myself today. Yes. Thank you so much. Just okay. re really would like to uh, remind the audience that we're uploading weekly podcast with hit experts very few phds so this is an episode we're seeing we're on uh, linkedin uh youtube uh spotify every week uh kathy thank you so much don't forget to uh hit like subscribe everybody and we'll see you uh next week in another podcast um the history podcast see you guys <laughs>